place on Earth where you can come and see architecture like this and these cars. What is the national sport as far as popularity? Baseball, baseball, baseball. baseball. Oh, that looks good. Woo! Anyway, 1960. That's who won the fishing tournament. What do you think they're saying? <laughs> I don't know. That's the only time they ever met. My theory always was that Penny and I was hung like a hamster. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm Anthony Bourdain. I write, I travel, I eat, and I'm hungry for more. indeed one of the more beautiful cities I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot of them. I wasn't prepared for this, how beautiful it would be, how relatively unspoiled by time, how over 50 years later it looks like the Havana of dreams, only maybe a little shabbier. Exiled Cubans watching this show, missing their country, angry about being separated from family and friends, a world left behind, a lot of them are not going to be satisfied with this show. We can't show you the whole Cuba. This show's not about communism, which I generally abhor, or about Fidel Castro, about who I also have decidedly mixed emotions. And that, I know, won't be enough for some people. Hey, hey. This show is about the Cuban heart. About everyday things, big and small, like baseball. Children's faces. Buildings, cars, and of course, food. Nearly everybody owns their own home. Education up to PhD level is free. Medical care is excellent by most nation standards and also free. But significantly, there are no internet cafes, no MTV, no Twitter. There is no freedom to speak with the rest of the world or have the same conversation that nearly everyone else on the planet can. Most importantly, you can't leave. But it's gorgeous. The beer is good and the rum is excellent. The cigars you know about. And the Cuban people? Cubans, wherever they are, and whatever path they've chosen, are proud people. And pride is usually a good thing. In Cuba, the religion is baseball. Traditionally, the wellspring for some of the best players in the world. They start them young. First, let me ask this. What is the national sport? I mean, as far as popularity. Baseball, baseball, baseball. Baseball, baseball. baseball. Not soccer. Only, it's the only game. Not soccer. This is what really makes it completely off the, off the radar as far as the rest of Latin America is concerned. Peter Bjarkman is from Lafayette, Indiana. He's a former linguistics professor who got hooked on Cuban baseball after seeing the national team play at the Atlanta Olympics. He's an acknowledged expert on the subject, a historian of Cuban baseball, and also an enthusiast. Those two teams are 10th of October. And Cerro. Cerro, which in Spanish means hill. And that's the hill district of Havana. It's the 10th of October versus Cerro. They're rivals from cross town. And the blood runs hot today. As this is the 9 and 10 year olds championship game, determining who's best in Havana. I have to tell you, I was in Little League. I don't remember that many, you know, how many umpires have got here. Notice the packed house. That's normal. Standing room only, and they are into the game. A full crew of four umpires. These moms are into it, huh? Oh, yeah. Hard to imagine suburban soccer moms shaking their asses to Afro-Cuban between pitches. But here, also normal. Cerro jumps out to a quick lead, putting up three runs in the top of the first. But 10th October's starting hurler settles down, and their bats are devastating. They start playing, you know, they're picking up a baseball, and they're out there, you know, on the weekend when they're, you know, three and four and five years old. And you know, the system here is that the kids are picked out for athletic talent in various sports, and they're sent to the sports academy. Sports academies across Cuba select the most talented kids and train them to play professionally. Their regular education coincides with that training. I love it like this. Is, you know, there isn't a person in here. 
coaches, the players, if there isn't a person in here that isn't totally focused on what's happening on, on the field. Personally, I'm scouting for a future shortstop to fill an upcoming hole in the Yankee roster. Someone who can hit the long ball. Yeah, yeah but looks like a power hitter. In the end, the home team comes through. There is rejoicing and tears. The fans go on. This uh, is a photograph of Fidel waving from the balcony of the Pennsylvania Hotel. That's right. 1959. The young man. I was a young man. Him, I was and you, you were how old? 18. Meet a man. A New Yorker who made all the most important decisions of his life when he was 17 years old. Roberto Salas was born in the Bronx. You can hear it, still, in his voice, like he was standing on Fordham Road yesterday. His father was a photographer who owned a photography studio that became a meeting place for anti-Batista Cubans. One day, this man walked in the door. Castro. That's Castro. That's my father's. That's in 55 in New York. Off to Cuba, because it seemed at the time the exciting thing to do for an ambitious and idealistic teenager. And right away, Roberto found himself right in the center of things, the new regime's favorite photographer. In the next few months alone, Roberto got what are considered some of the most iconic photographs of the central players. This, this is one of the very... Oh, this is an iconic photograph. That's a once-in-a-lifetime photo, by any standards. In 59, Roberto was an American citizen, but employed by a state-run paper in Cuba, which, given Cuba's close and growing relationship with Soviet Russia, did not endear him to, among others, the FBI. Going home was suddenly awkward at best. You went back to New York and suddenly you had a problem. You, you, the FBI was not happy with you. Yeah, I had a couple of problems. No, I had to leave the country and a bit of a hurry. And when I finally got here, I stayed. At 17, Roberto Salas stepped from childhood into a unique and extraordinarily privileged position in a new power structure in a country not his own. He still, with the revenue from his photos and with his access, lives a life far different from the average Cuban. How does he think it all turned out? It's an obvious question. How come you're not living in a townhouse in Greenwich Village, you know, with, a, with your own gallery, uh, you know, living large? Or why didn't you make that move at any point in all those years? My life changed completely. After that, I started throwing roots, I got married, I had a kid, uh, this and that. So, you know, I didn't want to go back to New York. It's said around here, quietly, no doubt, that the only three things the revolution actually got right was sports, education, and health care. And that the three things it does worst are breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They are, it's useful to point out here, still using ration cards 50 years after the revolution. And until recently, all restaurants in Cuba were like this one, state-owned. It's called El Aljibe, and they're famous for their chicken. Ah, this is especially the Beautiful. Roast chicken. The roast chicken arrives with the famous orange sauce, and of course, beans and rice. You gotta have those. It's good, real good, but the beans are awesome. Truly wonderful. There's a Cuba way of doing beans, which is called sleeping beans. They make them on Monday and they eat them on Tuesday. Right. If you wait till Wednesday, they're even better. Ah, to, to thick it up the... Right. Because overnight, all those starches get into the water, into the juice. Right. I like those beans, huh? Oh, I do. Well, do you think the camera, at the end of the day, does the camera always tell the truth? No, the camera is one of the worst liars in the world. I wouldn't have expected you to say that. Why, why do you, what do you mean? Because the mind that's behind the instrument is what goes into the image. I don't deny the fact that at the beginning, I was totally enamored of the whole system that was happening in Cuba. My images reflect that. Fidel, for me, is a, an exceptional individual. If I didn't feel that way, maybe I wouldn't have taken the pictures that I took of him. You spent a lot of time in Cuba. What's the best thing about Cuba? Day to day, the little things make you happy. Look, the attitude, the way that, the way that people take things. And they're very human, they're very kind. Here, they take you for what you want. You're an American, you're an American. They got an animosity but with the government. They separate policy from the human being. That is something you got to admire. I do admire that. I do it all the time. And the question everybody's wondering about, what's next? I mean, you know, a lot of people, a lot of Miami Cubans I know and I, and I hear from, but I mean, I can tell you right away, I'm going to catch a lot of in the show. Just the fact that I'm here. Just that I allow myself to have a good time, go to a Little League game, and say, man, look at the kids, they're cute. There are a lot of people with a zero tolerance on this issue. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. How, how do you reconcile that, or, or do you? Or will, will it ever, you know, what do you think? To figure out what's going to happen. 
you're going to need a, a crystal ball, you might say. But Fidel, eventually, is not going to be in the picture. What the animosities are going to be, what's going to flourish, what's not going to flourish. I don't know what's going to happen. You don't know. I don't know. I don't know. End of the day, I return to my hotel, the legendary Nacional, another world from the average Cubans, from another time as well. Here was where Meyer Lansky and Lucky Luciano held their famous mob summit, where Sinatra boned Ava Gardner, where the rich, the famous, the thrill-seeking used to gather, back when Cuba was a Caribbean playground, a magnet for bad behavior. As with many things here, the luster of those days has gone. Havana is one of the world leaders in organic urban agriculture. Largely, it should be pointed out because they couldn't afford to do it any other way. But credit where it's due. They've managed over the last few years to get some more fresh stuff in a local market. Every day here? A little bit. At the moon Every day here in the same spot. At the Ejido Market, I meet Elizabeth Espinosa, the kind of tough, resolute, hard-working operator you need to be in this country if you're going to navigate the complicated and difficult road to owning and operating your own restaurant. Making money, a profit, doing your own thing goes against everything the Cuban Revolution was supposedly about. But reality is reality, and it reaches eventually even the most steadfast idea. Here you can get about anything. Nara Valdez is a Cuban journalist with whatever constraints and privileges might come with that job. And she's been eating at Elizabeth's since she was a little kid. So this is relatively new though, this urban farming? Yeah, around 2000, the government started helping farmers so they can produce more. It wasn't always like this. When the Soviet Union collapsed and stopped propping up Cuba's economy, the country entered what it called the special period. What was special about it was that everybody became extra specially hungry, as there was suddenly just no damn food. Subsistence gardens, illegal of course, sprung up in vacant lots all around Havana. Now, most of the produce from these operations must go to the government for distribution. But the growers can sell their surplus, and much of that ends up at places like this. They call Elizabeth Godmother, and it's easy to see why. An ever-circling orbit of men seem to shadow her every move. People to deliver her food, to carry her bags, drive her back and forth. Now we're just going to the butcher shop to get pork, mainly. Produce, you can haggle. Meat, the price is controlled at a national level. But when you buy as much as Elizabeth, there is, or there does appear to be, some wiggle room. Well, even though she said price, she was negotiating the fact. That's what happens when you're friends with a butcher. Right, well, you always get a little extra. <laughs> She's a one-woman stimulus package, facilitating every variety of commerce, jobs, and even micro-economies in her wake. In a bright, lime green building not far away, down a corridor and around a corner, tourists and locals alike line up for tables at Elizabeth's restaurant, Paladar Los Amigos. Unlike the state-owned restaurants, which are largely for foreigners and the Cuban elite, Paladars are small, privately owned establishments that operate out of the proprietor's homes. Private enterprise like this was strictly forbidden, but the economic crisis, and generally more of an economy, forced some reforms. Years ago in Cuba, it was not allowed for Cubans to have dollars. Mm -hmm. You could go to jail and find out you have any five cent coins in jail. Then they allowed that, and the year after, they allowed private businesses to open. The minute it was legal, Elizabeth opened this place. The rules, as in any nightmarish bureaucracy-heavy system, are always changing. In the beginning, only family members could work in a paladar. That's now changed. Paladars are still limited to 16 seats, and the government takes a heavy, heavy monthly bite out of your end. But the rules are increasingly ambiguous. A lot depends on who you know. Elizabeth, she stayed with the tradition that back in the days you had to hire your family. Her nephews work here, her son-in-law, and the daughter. So who's cooking today? The daughter. Today, it's pork. You're unlikely to ever see a fat T-bone steak for sure, so pork. Masa de cerdo, marinated, hacked up, and pan-fried. Nara's also having pork, escalo, a cutlet, pounded, breaded, and fried. Served with the trinity of yucca, rice, and beans. Oh, wow. Nice. All right. Well, let's dig in. Amazing rice. Amazing. Mm -hmm. But 
Tender. It was fresh. It was home cooked. That's what I like about Palavares. You feel like you're at home. You're eating in her dining room, pretty much. Locals actually eat here too, but are able to because we, meaning tourists and foreigners, basically subsidize their meals, meaning we pay more, lots more. It's a two-tier pricing scheme, us and them. Oh, that's good, man. This was a good meal. Now, I noticed at the market, got a lot of men running around saying, what can I do for you? Women have to be very tough on men here in Cuba. Why? Okay. Men are pretty. <laughs> That's I'm kind of noticing. This is what you call a thriving business. I mean, there's people stacked up out there waiting to get in. How many customers a day? She says a lot, but probably 200 people a day. Two. 200 people a day? That's a successful restaurant anywhere in the world. And I'm guessing in Cuba it's a little harder than New York. And New York is hard. So, my respect. <laughs> 200 people a day may cycle through these doors and jam these small rooms, but it's still a home. You've all seen the pictures. The movies of old American cars still on the road down here in Cuba. But I didn't really believe it till I got here. It actually is like that. Everywhere you look, car after car after car is a 60-year-old Detroit classic in varying stages of preservation or dilapidation. They certainly do their best. Modified, mongrelized, customized, or simply glued and taped together, most look really good. If there's one trait that's distinctly Cuban, it's making the most with what you've got. And they are justifiably proud of these enormous hunks of rolling steel, because they represent decades of work and improvisation, and because they know what some of these things will be worth outside the country. Real bucks. It's not just the cars and the buildings that are still here, still trapped in amber. There are bars, too. I'm lured by the 40s nautical theme to this random bar. It's mojito time. Portholes and fish tanks. I love that. So I step in out of the blue and into the deep. Double duty. Satisfy my curiosity about this clearly state-owned establishment and catch up on my rum drinking, which is something you should really do a lot of here. Oh, boy. Oh, that's some breakfast. One 70-year-old Havana Club, please. That, oh, wow. That's very good. That's like cognac, man. Ooh, that's nice. Uno más? No, otro? Si, gracias. I hope I'm not getting a bad impression of Americans. I mean, I'm not bad at mojito. I'm pretty healthy serving a straight rum, and my second mojito's coming all in like 10 minutes. Other than the addition of perhaps pirate garb for the servers and bartenders, one could hardly improve on this place. Perfectly preserved. And they make an excellent mojito as well. You know, it occurs to me, like Hemingway drank daiquiris, right? It's kind of a girly drink. He's picking on that nice Fitzgerald that was calling him gay and stuff, and then he's drinking, like, daiquiris. My theory always was that Hemingway was hung like a hamster. Not that there's anything wrong with that. As one rum, then another, burns a slow hole in my empty stomach, I decide to venture an order of escabeche, usually kingfish cooked and marinated and served chilled. The fish oil and vinegar should mix nicely with the rum and lime juice. Yeah, that, hey, that looks good. Get in on there, my friend. Take a look at that. Oh, this is... I could easily stay here the rest of the day, and frankly, I'd like to. But the bitch goddess television awaits. Work to do. In Havana's Parque Central, there's an argument group. Not unusual around here, as this is Argument Central. It's been going on like this for years, every damn day. It's called La Esquina Caliente, or the Hot Corner. Baseball slang for third base. And you come here to fight. Fortunately, I've got Cuban baseball expert Peter Bjorkman on my side, and he's more than fluent in Cuban Spanish. You have these guys that gather here every day to talk baseball. They all have membership cards. They're licensed by the government to be an official club. Are, are these ex-players? I mean, what, no, what, no, no, what, no, what no, gives them fans. this official status? They're fans. Professional fans. They're professional fans. Like and government they're... license fans. <laughs> these fans are given an official license to assemble publicly and argue. The discussions invariably become quite heated, and that official status helps when authorities can 
accuse a bunch of people arguing over the utility of the sacrifice bunt for a political rally. And a lot of these guys just show up there every day and they have these passionate debates about what's going on in the league. Which, which can slip over into politics. Oh, absolutely. One of the interesting things for me when I first came here was discover how passionate these guys are about the players that have left here. That are branded officially by the government as being traitors, but for these guys, some of their heroes are El Duque and Jose uh, so Contreras. So baseball transcends politics. Yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. No, no question about it. For the fans, absolutely no question about it. Is there a class component to what team you root for? No, no. no. Aquí la diferencia económica existe como en todo país del mundo. Yeah, yeah, there's no Hay obrero, and no, no team can spend more than the other on players. No, because the teams are all owned by the league. The salaries are all the same for all the players. So how does it feel? One minute, uh, Duque was making, what, like $125 a month here. The next minute he's in New York, he's making $10 million. Sí, 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 sí. Por ese motivo, la decisión que haya tomado el deportista cubano, en este caso el pelotero, se haya ido con nosotros. They totally supported this, because he's representing them. Cubano, he's still Cubano. He's a pelotero en Cuba. He's a pelotero en Cuba. He's a pelotero en Cuba. Hey, he's showing how good Cuban baseball is. The national team is Cuba's pride, and it's currently ranked number one by the International Baseball Federation. What's interesting is how much they know about American baseball without being able to see it. Okay, they're asking me a question, okay, now, right, about how many of the Cuban stars I think could play in the major leagues, okay? I think that all the members of the national team, maybe five or six or seven, would be stars. Right. Yeah. The Spain, Cespedes, Cepeda, uh, Abreu, uh, Castano, Ujuliki. Pedroso no, Pedroso no, Ulieski no. The rest would not be stars, but they would play at the major leagues. Oh, sí, 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 sí. Who's winning this year? Who's taking it all? Okay, ¿quién va a ganar este año entonces? Ah, pregunta. Old Havana is exactly what you want it to be. Old. Like a Hollywood set for 1950s pre-Castro Cuba. Except it's real. The UNESCO World Heritage Site. There is a lot of restoring going on as Cuba depends increasingly on tourism. But most of the buildings are in pretty rough shape. In dire need of structural repair. Michael Gonzalez Sanchez works for a group called Habaguanics, attached to the office of the city historian. Translator Adolfo Fuentes helps him explain how tourist dollars are directly funding restoration as well as social projects. Pero el gran enemigo de las ciudades antiguas históricas, the most important enemy of historic sections of cities and historical cities, is mainly real estate developers. In many instances, there is a lot of construction going on. Eso destruye al mismo tiempo. But at the same time, there is a lot of destruction going on. Michael and his group aspire to preserve and rebuild the many old buildings, while at the same time not forcing out the original residents or significantly screwing up the neighborhood. Ideally, they want this to be both a tourist area and somewhere where residents continue to live and work. Most revolutions do not have a lot of respect or affection for the past. And in fact, these are remnants of colonialism. So this is unusual. We should say that heritage and history, they have no ideology. It's like not having to drink in this cup of coffee. This coffee was actually grown by African slaves. This, my friend, is a story of centuries of violence, murder, war, a bloody road to this cup. Cobblestone streets, magnificent colonial villas, crumbling homes of a long gone middle class. Havana is beautiful. Even shabby, run down, neglected Havana is beautiful. Not defaced by glass and steel boxes of the modern age. Let me tell you something. This square is spectacular. Have these people have no money at all? These houses wouldn't have been built. Hey, the aristocracy, they might be tough to live with, but they tend to leave nice buildings behind. Michael's government line boosterism is a small price to pay for a look around accompanied by someone very knowledgeable in dates and architectural periods. And they seem to be doing a good job of it, if the mission is to turn old storefronts into smart restaurants and bistros for the tourist trade. 
but no Cuban could ever afford to eat at these places. And when I ask about this, well, it's an awkward moment. The restaurants with music, cocktails, they're charging prices that are out of reach of the average Cuban. In a perfect world, though, should Cubans be able to afford to eat in the same restaurants as the tourists? Is there something inherently bourgeois about being able to afford $6 for a drink? I don't think so. All right, good. <laughs> On one hand, they're doing beautiful restoration work. And if they're looking to keep it a neighborhood as well, great. But who will eat here? Who will shop here? Will remain embarrassing questions. I'm eating the guys for lunch, but I can, it seems, never resist the urge to get my face or other part of my skull carved up by a stranger with a sharp blade. I'm trusting that way. You know, my last barber scene didn't end so well. Maybe you remember this. Was it Joseph's Cambodia? I not seem too busy either. How many of these do idea what the gentleman is saying, by the way. I mostly kept my eyes closed and dreamed of puffy pink clouds and unicorns. Somewhere, I could hear my camera guys muttering something about how he was nervous, and I could certainly feel the man's trembling fingers on my neck as he came at me with a straight razor. But in my zen-like state of calm, I was blissfully unaware that in the world outside my head, it was like carving a roast, a slaughter fest, the red, red crawly spilling like rain. Nice unicorn. Nice. Man, that's a close shave. I'm not going to need... Whoa. That's like a baby's bottom. This face is at least three times as smooth as Kim Kardashian's ass. In fact, I bet her ass is stubbly after a couple of days. You just know that, right? Thank you, sir. Gracias. Don't be worried there for a while. She's going to leave. Later, my facial wounds cocked closed with some kind of industrial grout. I joined Michael, Mara, and one of our many fixers, Mariana, for some seafood at El Templete, another state-owned restaurant. This one, part of the City Historian Associated projects Michael's been working on. And all the profits made here, mostly from gringos like me, are said to be poured back into restoration. They've brought in a Basque chef from Spain, and the food is good, disconcertingly good. You've got damn luxurious. Wow. Wow, this smells nice. good. It's good, right? It looks better. Marna Taco is a decidedly Spanish Basque seafood stew. The name literally means from the pot. Fresh tuna, potatoes, onions, tomato in a seafood broth. Traditionally eaten by fishermen in the Cantabrian Sea, but very nice, swank even, on a warm Cuban afternoon. God, this is good, buddy. This is very good. Yes, <laughs> yes, you're right. How are you looking forward into the future? How can you keep the, the beautiful things and, and yet at the same time become part of it? The rest of the world. We're an island, we have a lot to teach, a lot to show and to say, but the world also has to be ready to welcome Cuba. Education is what's going to make the difference. I really think that's so, the as, point. As long as Cuba remains the most educated island in the Caribbean, its future is insured. I'm not always that optimistic, but yes, I think that's... Because it is a unique factor. It is. Oh, wow. Fido, another Spanish dish. Think paella made with noodles instead of rice. Kind of. Squid, squid ink, giant prawns with garlic aioli. Nice. And again, very luxurious for these parts. Wow, that's good. <laughs> I think we all agree that the day will come where everybody, everybody wants this. Everybody wants to see this. Everybody wants to experience this. It's a terrible responsibility. El, el turismo eh, es necesario para los centros históricos. It's eternal debate. Tourism is necessary for historical places, but the historical places cannot be only working on tourism. Pierde esa originalidad. Because they lose that authenticity that they have. I tried feeding everybody as many mojitos as possible, by the way, to, you know, loosen them up a little, with varying degrees of success. Or was that just me drinking mojitos? I would love to have seen so many places that I've been look the way it looks here. I want to say to Michelle that I, I wish you well. Because I, I think it's a really, I think it's a good thing you're doing. We all agree with that. <laughs> Estadio Latino Americano. 
home of the Industrialis. It's been a dream of mine to see a Cuban baseball game in Cuba, and here I am. To say that the fans here are passionate would be an egregious understatement. They live and breathe this game. Perfect day for baseball. Peter knows his way around here very well. So this is my internet. This is a home game for the Industrialis. They're five games out in their division. Four, four and a half games out of uh, fourth place. They have, well, the four and a half games out of fourth. Yeah, they have to finish fourth to qualify for the playoffs. It's 13 and a half out of first. And there's only 15 games left. They got to make up a four and a half game difference. And the other team is? Seattle the Avila is in first place in the other division. It's one of the Industrialis' worst season ever. And it's a midweek day game due to the fact that the stadium lights are busted. Still, the game is well attended. Now, how do these guys get off work? Some, you know, Tuesday. I think a lot of them don't work. You know, I mean, there's a lot of unemployment in this country. Tickets to the games are less than a dollar for general admission. And look at these seats. The lights haven't worked in ages, and the roof is crumbling. Snack options are limited, to say the least. None of this, however, gets in the way of the game. Watching fans is nearly as much fun as watching the game, particularly when the opposing team's pitcher returns to the dugout only a few feet away from the fans. They get on him back. Some serious and lewd ball busting. The band, by the way, is not employed by the club, just an organized group of super fans. They show up every day, instruments in tow. thing about Cuban baseball, however, one unforgivable thing, no beer. That's the bottom line for me. This season, they, they've outlawed beer in this stadium because they had a lot of fights in the stands because people have been drinking heavily. No beer? No beer. This is a brutal and, a brutal and repressive dictatorship, and we need a regime change. Yeah. <laughs> no beer? The revolution is clearly a failure. Count me out, commie teetotalers. Baseball needs beer. Well, there's your hot dog. I have a pan con salsicha, a sort of cheap-ass mutant socialist hot dog variation, but without beer to wash it down, it's more choking hazard than lunch. Without beer, it tastes like ashes. Industriales managed to put a few crooked numbers up on the board, and when Sergei Perez launches one into the left field bleachers, it's all over. A rocket to Russia that crushes the other team's hopes of a comeback. Things, and I'm off in search of beer. Before I go, there's some place I have to go for a more typical, everyday Cuban meal. Uh, I've been passing by the place every day, and it looks like exactly the sort of place I should be eating here. Across the street, they're selling rubbers, which I gather are much needed around this neighborhood after dark. By day, it's a working class area like any other. Kids going to school, people going to work, people scrabbling to get by. But even here, it's gorgeous. So I gather this is more like the typical everyday food of Havana. Let's face it. I've been living large by Cuban standards. There's some meat in there somewhere. Oh, there it is. I've been to a lot of places, but I can't think of another place that's been less by time than Havana. Say what you will about everything else. It's beautiful. Heartbreakingly beautiful. Look at those buildings. That waterfront. You can't buy that anywhere else for any price. 
The Cuban people, open-hearted, friendly, relentlessly curious, sophisticated about nearly everything. There's a sense that people are holding their breath, waiting to see what happens next. I don't know what happens next. No one does. But if you can, you should come here with your eyes open and see. See everything you can, both the good and the bad. Look at it, because it's beautiful, and it's still here.